Mark 16, and then Luke 24. Let me remind you that this is the word of our Lord. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stopped and stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And the Lord said to them, what things? And they said, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all of this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our own company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And Jesus said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread, he blessed it and broke it, and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And then he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did our our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they arose immediately that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, those who were with them, gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon Peter. And then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. And as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened. They thought they saw a spirit. And then he said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet? It is I, myself, touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they were still disbelieving for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it before them. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything that stands written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it stands written that the Christ should suffer on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the word before us this morning. Thank you so much for Luke picking up the pen and recording these precious words about 
our Savior who is raised from the dead and appeared to his own, how amazed they must have been and yet how encouraged they must have been, Father, to go forth and fulfill the commands of God and proclaim the name that had been raised from the dead and had been crowned king and proclaim that name to every nation that there would be salvation in that name that had been given to us. Father, thank you for the words that we've read and thank you, Father, for the spirit that dwells within us that we can understand your word and be encouraged by the same word and through that same spirit be filled with joy that brings us into worship and be empowered that causes us to speak about that name to those who do not know him. Father, I pray that you'd help us this morning. I pray that your spirit would fill us this morning as we draw near to you and as we open up your word. We pray for your help, Father. So, Lord, we pray that you would grant us these things in Jesus' name, for it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Come to an end of a very long journey in the gospel of Luke, and my intention is to end this morning, maybe. But Luke has reminded us of some extraordinary things when you think back, back past on the, the last couple of years. And not only has he reminded us some things, but I'm convinced that the Lord has taught us all some truly amazing things in his gospel. And he closes it out by putting emphasis where Luke wants emphasis. And it's on three things. It's on the word of God the witness of the gospel of God and the worship of God. And I want to show you how he weaves those three things into the text this morning, the word, the witness, and the worship. And he talks about all of these things in the context of the resurrected Lord. So listen to this, if you will. And it really is just a summary of what I'm trying to communicate this morning. Since God has raised Jesus from the dead, believe everything written in the scriptures because all of the scriptures point to the resurrected Christ. And then since God has raised Jesus from the dead, proclaim his name among the nations because it is only through the resurrected Lord that anyone can ever have hope for eternal life. Right. And then thirdly, I think Luke wants to see or show us rather since God has raised Jesus from the dead, worship God in great joy because God has fulfilled his promise and now we, too, have resurrected life in him. And so, see, all of this is in the context of the resurrected Lord. And all of this motivates us to hear the word and believe and to worship God and then to witness to the glory of God. Now, again, what we finish this morning or tonight, you've got two narratives sitting side by side. And that Luke blends them very carefully in verse 36 as they were talking. But he takes us down a road for a specific reason that I'll show you in just a second. And he brings that conversation in among all the disciples and Jesus appears in both places and he runs all of that across with very one theme. And let me show you briefly what that is. You've got your Bibles, Mark 16. Turn back there with me real quick. And let me show you a little bit of an outline for all the gospels. Mark 16. And if you have subtitles, this is super helpful. If you don't, it's a little more difficult to see. But in Mark 16, Mark just gives these three bullet points at the end, and then he closes out his gospel. His first bullet point, he talks about how Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene, and he covers that three verses, then he goes on. Then Mark drops a bullet point, Jesus appears to his two disciples, and that's in regard to the road of Emmaus, two verses, and then he moves on. And then Mark concludes with, in verse 14, the Great Commission. So You've got a conversation with Mary, a conversation with two disciples, and then Mark gives the Great Commission, and then his gospel is finished. Now, when we look at that, which gospel writer ends his gospel with the Great Commission? That's where he wants to go, and that's his grand conclusion. Matthew does that. Remember what he says in Matthew 28. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go, write and make disciples of all nations. So that's how Matthew concludes his entire resurrection story. Which gospel writer concludes with Jesus speaking to Mary Magdalene? Which gospel writer is the personal guy, the intimate relational guy? That's John. 
And so John concludes his gospel with a conversation between Mary and the Lord. Mary's standing at the tomb. She's weeping. She thinks Jesus is the gardener. And she asks him, where did you put his body? And Jesus says, Mary. And Mary turns around. And so John winds up his gospel with two very personal stories. Conversation with Mary. And then, of course, the conversation with Peter where he says, Peter, do you love me? Three times, right? Which gospel writer, using this thought, concludes his gospel with a conversation with two disciples walking down the road, which is in the middle of Luke in verse 12. Who does that? That's Luke. And the reason that Luke wants to do that is because Luke wants to take us to the place that he wants us, and that is the Word of God. Luke wants us to rest in the resurrected Lord and then go back and reflect on the Word of God. And so Luke pulls this theme through his whole letter, and which makes Luke one of my favorite gospels, right? Because his key has always been the Word of God from beginning to end. Now, you're in Mark 16. Turn the page to Luke chapter 1. And I'll remind you of how Luke started his gospel out. Look at verses 1 and 2. Luke writes, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers are servants of the word, have delivered them to us. And so Luke says, you know where I got my gospel? I'm about to pick up the pen and, and write 24 chapters about the Lord. You know where I got my gospel? I got it from those guys that were firsthand eyewitnesses and ministers of the word of God. And so what I studied and what I've received from them, that is the basis for everything that I've written. Now, when you go to the end of Luke, now go back to where we were and where I read this morning to Luke chapter 24. Look at some of Luke's last words. Look at verse 44. Luke writes, Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened up their minds to understand the scriptures. But it's not just there. Look at verse 32. The two men on the road to Maus gave testimony. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And then look back at verse 27. When the Lord speaks to those two men, he says, in beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So that's John's thread, or that's Luke's thread, rather. That's a thread that he pulls all the way through the book because he's trying to drive us back to the scriptures because the scriptures confirm Jesus as the Christ. And now he's raised from the dead and his resurrection confirms the scriptures as well. And Luke used all kind of words to describe the word of God. He used the word itself or logos. He's used the law. He's used the scriptures. He's used the commandments. But in all the words that Luke uses, the word written is my favorite. And you've noticed Ever since we started Luke a couple of years ago, every time I come across the word written, I read it stands written. The word in Greek is grapho, which we will get where we get our word graphite, where we have in our pencils and we write. That's the word that Luke likes to use often. He uses it in a perfect tense and it's always in this sense. These are the words that stand written that cannot be changed. Look back at verse 44. Notice what he writes. These are my words that I spoke to you while I still with you, that everything, here it is, grapho, everything that stands written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened up their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it stands written. This is Luke. This is where he wants us to end up with the word of God knowing that everything God has written, we can trust. So he understands absolute necessity. It's these words that God has written down for us that give us life, 
These are the words that equip us for life. These are the words that prepare us for the next life. These are the words in which we meet God. These are the words which we have peace with God. These are the words that give us comfort for today and hope for tomorrow. And this is where my ministry has been based to you guys for the last eight years. And Lord willing, for many more years, I'm always going to turn your hearts back and back and back to the word of God because it is so very important. I think it was Wednesday night that I said this, and I've said this often. This is the only thing that we have that has one foot on earth and one foot in heaven. That's the word of God. And so we understand this word is the singular source for wise living and just a wellspring for deep and unshakable joy. Now, I've heard it said and I heard it this week and that's why I bring it up, because when I heard it, I thought, yeah, that's exactly where I am this week. Someone said this week, you can know the word of God, but not know the God of the word. Now, I realize there's some truth to that. But most of the time, people who say that are preachers who are trying to justify their lack of time that they spend in the word. And it makes them somehow feel better by saying, well, you know, you can know that word, but you might know the, not know the God of the word. And so they try to justify that. And and true that there are people who know a great many facts in the Bible and they know a great many doctrines of the Bible and they can argue their points convincingly. But I'm convinced that they don't know God. Right. But I know this for certain. It is impossible to know God personally apart from the word of God. If we don't know the if we don't study and pour ourselves into the scriptures, we don't know God like we can know God. In fact, when I think about my dearest friend, he spends more time in the Bible than anyone else I know. He knows more of the Bible than anyone else I know. And he has a closer and more personal and deep relationship with God than anyone else I know. And so I know this, if you want to know God more, you have everything necessary because you have the spirit of God living in you as believers and you have the word of God sitting in your lap. And so we have to pour ourselves into understanding this word. But even in that, we still have a problem, don't we? And Luke points to our problem. Look at verse 25. Notice what he says. And this is the Lord speaking Luke 24, verse 25, the Lord says, O oh, foolish one, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. That's where we are. And, and that is so frustrating. Even though we have the word of God, we have the spirit of God, yet we still find ourselves so slow, so slow to believe these things that we write, or the, these things that God has written down for us. And, you know, the reason for that is really quite simple, right? Where do we find the reason for that? Genesis 3. That's the reason why we are so slow of heart to believe the things that we read in the Bible. The effect of the fall was absolutely devastating. Not only did it cost us our lives, but it also prevented us from understanding God and his wisdom found in his word. And you can't know God's wisdom and you can't know God's word apart from Christ. So we come to relationship with God through Christ in his word. But even sitting to understand his word, we still need the grace of Christ. When Adam rejected the command of God and trusted in his own wisdom, true wisdom, God's wisdom was hidden from him. And so when we sit down to read this book, right, we pray what the psalmist prays in Psalms 119. Open my eyes that I might see wonderful things in your word. You need to do that every time you sit down and open this book. Father, please open my eyes. In fact, Luke uses this word three times. One other word. Look back at verse 27 and notice what the Lord says. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the scriptures, all the scriptures concerning himself. Jump to verse 32. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? Look at verse 45. Then he opened their minds 
It's all in the passive voice. And it's a divine passive. It's what God is doing. You may open the pages of the book, but God's got to open the heart and the mind to understand the wisdom that you read. This is not a natural thing. This is not a physical thing. This is not a human thing, if you will. It's a spiritual thing. And when you open the book of these, when you open this book, it, it, you're spiritually engaging with the God who created the heavens and the earth. And you need his grace to understand what it is that you're reading. In this word, in fact, it's interesting. This word opened is the same word that is used to mean the opening of the womb. And you think about that when the womb is opened, life is received, right? Until the womb is opened, there is no life that comes forth. And when we open up the scriptures, you need to understand this. It's like that womb. Life is coming forth from the pages and you're experiencing life, the newness of life every time you sit down and open the word of God. Apart from the word of God, all of your experiences are nothing but death. But when you open up the words of life, what comes forth, what pours forth from heaven is life. And so we must turn to these pages to experience this life. But the whole thing is grace, right? Again, passive voice. He opens it based on his grace. It's the grace of God that brings us to faith. It's the grace of God that keeps us in faith. It's the grace of God that sustains us in life. It's the grace of God that brings us into eternal life. And it's the grace of God that we need to sit and read and understand the truths that we find in Scripture. So Luke turns our hearts to the word. But he also turns our heart to a specific word, the gospel word that he wants us to understand. So look at verse 45 and 46 with me. Again, I'll keep bringing you back to these passages. The Bible says, then the Lord opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them and listen to the gospel. The Christ should suffer. And on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are my witnesses, he says, and behold, I'm sending the promise of the father upon you. But stay into the city until you're clothed with power from on high. Now, there's a lot here and I'll briefly point to all of these things. But we've mentioned all of these things as we walk through the gospel of Luke. This is the gospel by which we are saved. And this is the gospel that we proclaim in order that others might be saved. And it's one of the great purposes of the church. Matthew calls it our great commission, right? Again, it's one of our three big purposes to make disciples of all nations. And it's only done by proclaiming this gospel message. And so this is Luke's summary of that great commission that Matthew gives us. And it's of such great purpose that we cannot accomplish it apart from the spirit of God. Look at verse 49 again, what he says, I am sending you the promise of the or I'm sending you the promise my father of my father upon you. Stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. We can't even do it apart from the spirit of God. They've seen the resurrected Lord. They understand the scriptures and yet they're still not ready. And we've got to understand that too. We may understand the scriptures, right? We may experience the newness of life, but we're still not ready to proclaim that message unless we've received power from the spirit to do these very things. That's Acts chapter two. The spirit descends upon them and in tongues of fire. And what do they do? They go forth and speak some unknown tongue. Not at all. They go forth and speak the gospel in every known language of that day. So everyone in Jerusalem can hear the gospel proclaimed in their native tongue. And so these disciples who couldn't speak foreign languages, I imagine they could speak Greek. They could probably speak Latin. Certainly they could speak Hebrew, but they couldn't speak other known languages. And so the spirit of God gives them the ability to proclaim the gospel in every known language so that every man could hear this good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, that's Acts chapter two. But there's some elements here that Luke includes that we have to include in our gospel or we have no gospel. Look at this first element, it's the element of sin. Luke records the words in, in verse 47. 
that forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed. Look at verse 26. He gives us two words about this. Verse 26, he says to those two men, was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things? Look at verse 46. Jesus says to his disciples, thus it stands written that the Christ should suffer. And we talked about Hebrews 9 last week. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And we said that this is a part of the gospel. Unless Christ dies in our place for our sins, we die in our place for our sins. And so the need for forgiveness has to be proclaimed. And forgiveness is only found through his blood, right? You have to talk about sin. You have to talk about forgiveness. Not only that, you have to talk about repentance. Notice verse 47. Sinners must be aware that they must repent. Verse 47 says that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name. Now, so many have abandoned the gospel because they've abandoned the emphasis on sin. They've abandoned the need for forgiveness. They've abandoned the need for repentance. And a gospel without repentance is no gospel that saves. You have to talk about these things. You have to talk about repentance. You have to talk about forgiveness. Christ died for our, for our sins. How in the world can you exclude repentance and forgiveness? If you take sin out, You've taken the cross out. You've taken the cross out. There's nothing standing in between you and the wrath of God. And so the gospel that we find in the scriptures includes these things. But not only does it include forgiveness, not only does it include repentance, but it also includes a resurrected Savior. You know, when I think about these people that we see on television, whether they're athletes or movie stars that claims their relationship with Christ. If you'll notice that those who speak about the cross and those who talk about sin are the ones that you don't hear from often because the world finds that so offensive. But the ones that simply say things like, oh, the Lord has blessed me. Now they win a ball game and that's, oh, I just praise my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, right? Who's given me this ability and talent. I want to thank him. And they never mention sin. They never mention forgiveness. They never mention repentance. They never mention a dying Savior. The world is perfectly comfortable with those kinds of Christians. The problem is those aren't Christians. If you're not willing to talk about a bloody Savior dying on Calvary and the reason for that, you don't understand the gospel. If you cannot talk about the need for turning from your sin, you don't have a gospel, nor do you have a relationship with a Savior who died for your sins. And so as the church of the living God, we've got to be We've got to be radically committed. But the third thing that the world doesn't talk about is the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. And you won't hear that. Because if he was raised from the dead, you've got to go back to how he died. And if you go back to how he died, you've got to go back to why he died. And so these things have to appear. I mean, these things have to be a part of our gospel. And the Lord was raised from the dead for many reasons. I want to talk about a few of those things. And you know these things. But number one, for theological reasons. When Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, we rejoice because God has fulfilled his promise and God has delivered us from our sins. We know that theologically without question. God is a God of his word. So much of his word that he gave his son as a sacrifice for our sins. And then he turns around and raises him from the dead. And we look at God and we go, now that is a powerful and faithful God who always keeps his promise no matter what it costs him, right? So there's theological reasons, but there's also a lot of practical reasons for the disciples and for us. When the disciples saw Jesus raised from the dead, I'm sure their hearts were comforted and encouraged to know that Jesus had defeated death. You know, we sing, they didn't have the song, Because He Lives. What? 
I can face tomorrow. Do you realize what tomorrow held for these men and women? What it held for them was death. All of them, in fact, died for their faith in Christ, except one of them, John. Every one of them went forth and proclaimed his name among the nations. And every single one of them but one was martyred for their message that they were proclaiming. Now, how comforting and encouraging was it to know that death has been defeated because I saw the risen Christ. And I imagine Paul talks about in in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that he appeared to over 500 of his followers, which probably means Lazarus was in that group. Now, if you remember, Lazarus has already been raised from the dead. And then the Lord appears to him and Lazarus goes, yeah, I, I knew that. I knew I would see you. And so Lazarus is like twice ready for death. He's died, been raised from the dead. Jesus had died. He saw him raised from the dead. And Lazarus is like, why are y'all worried about dying? Exactly. You do realize it's nothing now. That God has stripped death of all of its power. And now we too shall be raised from the dead. So for practical reasons, when they saw Jesus raised from the dead, they're like, let's go and die. But for us, when we hear that Jesus has been raised from the dead, we understand a great deal about our own resurrection. Look at verse 36. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them. Does it say hovered or stood? Because there's a difference. I believe the text says stood. Not only does that, notice the next few words, and he said to them. Oh, he can talk? Yeah, he can talk. He can talk audibly and clearly. And they understand what he's saying. Notice what he says. Peace to you. But notice their response. They're still startled and frightened. They thought he was they were seeing a spirit. So he asked them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Notice, see my hands and my feet. None of this vapor or this cloud or this smoke that's just kind of floating from place to place. No, it's physical. It's literal. Jesus says, you want to see my hands? Here they go. They're hands, by the way. Want to see my feet? They are feet, by the way. They're just like yours. Then notice what he says. See my hands, my feet. It is I myself. Touch me. Wait, we're going to be able to like physically touch a resurrected body. Oh, yeah. What's it going to feel like? Is it going to feel weird? Is it going to feel squishy? Are your hands just going to kind of go right through it? No, not at all. It's going to feel a lot like this. It's going to feel like flesh and bones. In fact, that's what he goes on to say. Touch me and see for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. It's going to feel like it feels now, right? And then in verse 40, when he does this, they showed him his hands and his feet. And notice they still disbelieved. For joy and marveling, they were amazed. And so Jesus says this, all right, do you have anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of fish and he took it and he ate it before them. He's like, y'all, y'all are really struggling here. I mean, I got hands and feet. You've touched me. You see, I'm just, I'm like you. I'm talking. I'm, I'm walking. I'll tell you what, let's just sit down at the table and eat. And so they sit down at the table and Jesus eats a piece of fish. That's so encouraging to us. You know what we're going to be like? just like that. We're going to be just like this. As literal and as physical, yet spiritual and perfect in every way. Nothing dying, nothing falling out off the head. It's going to be absolutely perfect, but it's going to be so much like it is now. How do you know that? Because that's how he was raised. That's how we know that. Well, I know Jeremy in heaven. Yeah. Will I be able to shake his hand? Yes. Once we receive the resurrected body, will I be able to hug my wife? Yes. Will I be able to talk to my son? Yes. We'll be able to sit at the table and eat. Yes. We'll walk. We'll talk. We'll stand. We'll touch. We'll hug. We'll fellowship. We'll sing. We'll eat. It'll be just like this if it won't be fallen. It won't be corrupt. There won't be sin. There won't be sorrow. There won't be suffering. Tears will be absolutely foreign in glory because there'll be no need to cry. 
Aren't you glad Jesus was raised from the dead and we know how he was raised? These are wonderful things to us. But there's a very, there's another very important reason, practically speaking, that Jesus was raised from the dead. Notice verse 48. Jesus says, you are witnesses of these things. God just made for himself a whole lot of firsthand witnesses, eyewitnesses. And it was this eyewitness that these disciples and apostles went forth and proclaimed a resurrected Savior. I think Tyler has it for me, if he's still able to do that. If not, I can just read it to you. 1 John chapter 1. If you're taking notes, jot that down. And I'm going to read to you verses 1 through 4. John says, what was from the beginning, what we've heard, notice, what we've seen with our own eyes. What we've looked at, what we touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life that was manifested and we've seen it and we testify and we proclaim to you eternal life, which was with the father and has been made known to us. What we've seen, what we've heard, we proclaim to you also so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. These things we write so that our joy may be complete. John says, what I'm telling you, I saw with my own eyes. What I'm telling you, I touched with my own hands. This is not secondhand knowledge for these guys. It was firsthand knowledge for these guys. They knew it in their heads and they experienced it in their hearts. And so when they went forth to proclaim, they did so with great boldness because they had eyewitness testimony to everything that had taken place, right? So when you and I go forth and proclaim, where are we at? We're secondhand. Secondhand based on what? Firsthand. When I go forth and I preach the gospel or I share the gospel, I'm sharing it based on John's testimony because John's testimony has eyewitness accounts. He was firsthand. And so you and I always have the ability to go all the way back to firsthand as we talk about what John saw, what John touched, what John heard. This Christ who died for our sins was buried and was raised again. And then we can go on and talk about how that Christ has changed our lives. Man, we've got a great commission, but it's been made so easy for us. These are more real to us than anything in our life. So many of you got kids and, and how real are they, right? They wake you up in the middle of the night. They're so real. Do you realize the resurrected Savior that you proclaim is just as real as your own children? You have that much confidence to go forth and speak about a Jesus who died, was buried and was raised because you know it. You've banked your life on it. But again, it wasn't a hard bank for you because you're banking it on eyewitness testimony that these things are true. But, you know, he shows us you still need grace. You still need grace. Verse 22 of chapter 24. Notice back there with me. This is a little frustrating, but the women will understand. Look at Luke 24, 22. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us and they were at the tomb early in the morning. They didn't find the body. They came back saying that they'd seen an angel who told them that he was alive. And some of those who were with us went down to the tomb. And it was just like the women had said, but we, we, we did not see him. And then Jesus says, oh, foolish, slow of heart to believe. In other words, you're telling me that these women that you've known your whole life, that's walked beside you for the last three years being these followers of Christ, they give you testimony that Jesus is raised from the dead and you're still going, yeah, I don't know about that. And if you're a wife, you understand that perfectly, don't you? You say all these things, your husband goes, well, I don't know about that. But Jesus responds with, how, how foolish can you be that you don't bank it on their testimony? In fact, in Mark, if you're taking notes, put down 16, 14. It says, when he appeared to the eleven, he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who saw him risen. The Lord wasn't happy about this. 
He rebuked them for not believing their own. And then look at verse 36, or rather verse 38. When Jesus appears and they touch him, they see him. He still says, why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your own heart? We still need grace. Even though it's so simple for us, because we're fallen, you still have to have grace. Do you remember the disciple who was not here when Jesus appeared that Luke records? There was one that wasn't here. What was his name? Thomas. And so the Lord has to appear to Thomas. And he's like, see my hands? You see these holes in my feet? And then the Lord says, put your hand right here in my side. And so Thomas pushes his hand into the side of the Lord where he had been uh, stuck with that spear. And what does Thomas do? My Lord and my God, he falls on his face and proclaims, I believe. But then the Lord says something interesting to him. He says, Thomas, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You see what grace can overcome for us. You see what the spirit can do in our hearts because we won't see the resurrected Christ. Many claim that they've seen them. And when people do that, I like kindly turn and, and, and exit the building because they're scaring me. In fact, many false prophets proclaim today that they've seen the resurrected Christ. They've seen a spirit, but it was not the spirit of the Lord. And that's why they go and preach a false gospel. But you and I are not going to see the resurrected Lord until we get to glory. And yet we have believed and we have not seen. And Jesus says, oh, blessed are they. How blessed you are to have believed. But you've done so based on the grace of God. So when you think about all these things, where does that leave us? It leaves us in worship. After teaching us all these things, Luke wants us to be left with one thing and one thing alone, and that is the worship of God. Notice verse 50. Notice how Luke ends everything. He leads him out as far as Bethany, lifting up his hands. The Lord blessed him, and while he blessed them, he parted from there and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. The birth, the life, the death, the resurrection, the ascension, they'd seen it all and they fall on their face and they worship God continually because of these things. Luke wants us to wind up at worship. But if you remember, Luke began his gospel with worship. Remember there was one man going up to the temple to worship God. And that was Zechariah, right? He was the priest. He had been chosen by God through the drawing of lots to go up and burn incense in the temple. And while he was in the temple, he learned that God was beginning to fulfill his promise because it would be his son that would be the forerunner of Christ. And so Zechariah worships God in the midst of that. And now we know so much more looking at that first picture when we go up to worship God. Because Peter tells us, right, that we have been made a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a people for his own possession. And now God is not hidden behind a curtain Zechariah had to be so concerned about. No, that curtain has been torn in two from top to bottom. And now the way to God has been opened up and we're invited into the throne room based on the grace of God. And we can go up anytime we want. We're invited to come up into the presence of God and worship God having been made priests by His grace. So we are a people who have been made ready for worship and we are a people who have been made ready to witness. We worship because we know that Christ has been raised from the dead. We worship because we know that Christ has paid for our sins. We worship because we know that we've been accepted and adopted by God. So we worship with great joy and we witness with great joy. Now, just a couple more thoughts and I'll be finished. What's wrong with worship? I'm, I'm telling you, I have this conversation with every single pastor because every single pastor seems to struggle with worship in his church for whatever reason. And most often, the conversation is around form. Well, what kind of songs do you sing? Are you using, the, uh, using a, a book, a hymnal, or are you using screen? screen? 
What kind of instruments are playing? Who's leading that? And it seems as though all the conversation is around form, but form doesn't change worship. You know what's wrong with the church today and its worship? Joy, J-O-Y. They have forgotten that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. And if we would remember that, our hearts would be filled with joy. And it doesn't matter what's going on as far as form is concerned to lead us in worship. Because we would be so filled with joy, we would sing out in praises to God. Notice what it says in verse 52. They worshipped him, Jesus, and they returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually going up in the temple Blessing God. So we understand the word, right? Because Jesus has been raised from the dead. Now we can understand all the scriptures because all the scriptures point to the resurrected Christ. Because Jesus has been raised from the dead, we can proclaim his name to all nations, being confident and bold, knowing that that's the only hope for them. But listen, you want to pray for our worship corporately and you want to pray for your worship individually? Then pray and ask God to make it known to your heart once again that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. And when you begin to get a hold of that in your heart, you will be filled with joy because you do understand that that fixes all of our problems. Your sin, gone. Death, not an option for you anymore. Adopted and brought into the family of God to enjoy his presence forever. All that's because Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And when you get that rested and settled in your heart and you're mindful of those thoughts, you're going to worship God like you've never worshipped him before. Let's pray.